Hello and welcome everybody. We are going to get started momentarily. We are just uh, allowing folks to join the webinar. So stay, stay tuned. We will join and get started momentarily. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. I want to thank you for joining us today. We still are allowing a few people into the webinar, so we will get started shortly. Thank you very much for your patience. We are still have a lot of people joining us today, so we will get started momentarily.
Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Dina Marks, and I'm with ADL. Um, and we are so glad that you are all joining us for this webinar. We really appreciate you being here. Appreciate all of our guests also. Uh, as you saw in the opening slides, ADL is an organization that's mission is to fight hate, to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and secure justice and fair treatment for all. So um, we're all gonna keep that in mind as we start this off today. ADL's central division, this is a central division webinar, includes its Austin, Mountain States, Plains States, Southwest and Texoma regions. And we wanna thank them for working with us on this webinar with special thanks to ADL's Director of Hispanic Affairs, Monica Bauer. Um, and also a big, big thanks to all of our partners who've helped us support us as we were planning this webinar. We're gratified that so many organizations are willing to join with us. Um, and we don't have time to name them all here, but they were all mentioned on the slides, which you saw at the beginning and you'll probably see as you leave the webinar. I'm the Senior Associate Director of ADL Southwest Regional Office which includes the city of El Paso. During this presentation, if you have a question, please put it in the chat and we'll try to get it answered at the end. You're muted and we're not taking audio questions today. The FBI's annual report of hate crime statistics comes out in November. The statistics cover the year prior to the year that they come out. So, in November of 2019, we got the statistics for 2018. And those are our most recent statistics. And in 2018, the largest percentage of hate crimes were motivated by bias against race, ethnicity, or ancestry. Of that category, 47% of the crimes were motivated by bias against Blacks, and 13% were motivated by anti-Latino or Hispanic bias. My guess is that second number will go up for 2019 and 2019 definitely saw the deadliest hate crime against the Latinx community in recent American history with the murders of 23 people at a Walmart in El Paso. It happened just over a year ago on a Sunday morning, Patrick Crucius allegedly drove 11 hours from Allen, Texas to El Paso, went into a Walmart with an automatic semi-automatic rifle and opened fire. The impact of that hate crime cannot be measured just through the lives lost or in what happened that day. It continues to ripple through the lives of those directly or indirectly affected and indeed through all our lives because if a hate crime happens, it affects everybody. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Joining us today are Mauricio Ibarra Ponce de Leon, Consul General of Mexico in El Paso, firefighter and paramedic Josh Lefevre, El Paso resident and community activist Gabriela Cunha, the District 8 Director of the League of United Latin American Citizens, or LULAC, Al Maldonado, and last but certainly not least, ADL Vice President and Director of our Center on Extremism, Oren Siegel. I'd like to start our conversation today by asking each one of you the same question. I'd like for each one of you to briefly describe the morning of August 3rd, 2019, how you found out about the shooting and what you did right after that. And I wanna start with Consul General Ibarra. Consul General. Thank you. Thank you very much, Edina. First of all, um, thank you for the invitation. And just to say that uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and the Mexican Consulate Network values the, the relationship that we have enjoyed with ADL for a long time. Um, related to your question, um, actually, it was a Saturday morning and we were, I was uh, at home when I, when I learned about this uh, terrible situation. Uh, so, I think uh, as for everyone, it was uh, shocking news because um, we have uh, never heard of something like this happening in, in a city uh, as El Paso. So the first thing that I, uh, we needed to do, especially since it was uh, a weekend before uh, a school started and, and you know, uh, a shooting in, uh, in a Walmart near the border, obviously uh, uh, 
uh, was visited by many Mexicans. So the first thing that we needed to do is put out an emergency number so we could receive uh, any types of report or concerns so that we could uh, try to help uh, our community. And before anything happens, we decided to send people from the consulate to the different to different hospitals uh, because we didn't know where they where uh, the victims were going to be taken. So we sent people from the consulate to different uh, hospitals to see if uh, people from Mexico arrived, if we could help at, at some point. Um, also, we uh, established a, a camp at the reunification center that was opened by the city and the county, exactly for the same purpose, to help uh, any Mexican national who could arrive or the families of, uh, of the victims uh, who arrived. And we needed to, to be in touch with, uh, with the local authorities from the very beginning, because um, as you know, when something like this happens, the, the information that flows is, is very scarce and, and there is a lot of this uh, disinformation. So we needed to really to have the most scoring current information so we, so we could provide it to whomever needed to have information or so that we could relay it also uh, back to Mexico. Um, in those days, what we needed to do is um, help um, a, the Mexican uh, families and victims. So we supported them in case they needed to repatriate uh, the remains uh, to Mexico. Fortunately, the, the funeral homes were uh, very prompt on also in offering uh, services free to the community. Uh, but we also had to, to help um, our community. Uh, and we needed to, to help the families of the victims that were in El Paso, but they were not prepared to stay in El Paso, but they needed to after, after this terrible incident. And moving forward, what we needed to do and we did was uh, um, offer uh, legal, free legal help to the, to the victims and to the families um, in case um, they decided to take any, any legal action uh, moving forward. Uh, but basically the, the first part is always important is to really be with the families, support them in whatever they need in, the, in a very difficult time. And, and that's what we did. And just to mention that a, a couple of days later, uh, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Marcelo Ebrard, came to El Paso basically to, to talk to the, to the victims and to the families, to convey to them the, the, the solidarity and the condolences from the President of Mexico and to offer them all the help uh, they needed. It sounds like you were working 24 seven for several days on end. How long did that last? Well, at least for the next two weeks, we had a permanent presence in the hospitals 24 seven because my, the people, my staff stay at the hospitals all night long, all day long, obviously we switch uh, the personnel, but we needed to be there because the, the, these were very difficult moments. And also we needed to be, uh, to help the community find that there were a lot of people who were not found. So, you know, uh, talking to the different authorities, we look for, for the people, we help the community, our community, the Mexican community, recuperate, for example, their vehicles, because obviously the, the investigation to, took a long time and the cars that were at the site uh, uh, of the crime could not be taken out. So we helped them recuperate their property and eventually their vehicles. So it was, it was uh, a, few, a few weeks and a few months uh, tough, uh, but, but obviously uh, whenever you can do something to help your community. I think uh, uh, all the work, uh, it's, it's rewarded. Thank you, Consul General. I want to ask um, Mr. Lefevre to, to tell me what happened with him. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. OK. So um, for me, uh, the morning uh, that day was, um, it was we were we were at the station. Um, everyone was in good spirits. Uh, we were doing our, our normal station duties, um, you know, around the firehouse, and uh, we were actually uh, pretty much done with everything that we had needed to do for the day. Uh, and we were all just kind of hanging out, watching some funny videos. And it was a, a Saturday morning, so you know, we were uh, 
we were just getting ready to do shift change and um one of the uh one of the officers from the oncoming shift actually uh, came in and uh told us to uh grab a radio because there was a, an active shooter at Cielo Vista Mall um which turned out to be false information that was a, a big part of the confusion um so we uh we got a radio and we started listening to um the radio traffic that was coming in um and uh we looked up the card on our uh, our uh, MCT terminals that are in, inside the the units and we started seeing just so much information coming through um active shooter at Cielo Vista Mall another active shooter at Walmart um so there was there was some confusion as to where uh, the shooter was was located um shortly thereafter um we we heard the radio transmission come out from the first fire unit uh, that arrived on scene um and they did their uh, BIR which is basically a, it's a, it's a brief incident report um um and uh, the I'm not sure the exact officer that uh, that put this trans this uh, traffic out over the radio but he said um send me every available ambulance in the city uh we have um uh, uh multiple casu casualty incident and uh we ne we need every available ambulance to respond so when we heard that um we uh we started to get get ready uh to pretty much self dispatch ourselves um just driving in the direction of of uh Cielo Vista Mall because I work downtown at station 1 um which is about 8 miles away from from Cielo Vista and the Walmart there So we we started uh we started to mobilize our way um over there without even being dispatched because you could hear um you could hear the gravity of the situation over the radio and and we tell we could tell that we had something bad going on. So uh, as we're driving over there we were just going code 1 with no lights or sirens and pretty much immediately after we started driving uh then we we did, we got officially dispatched uh to go ahead and respond. So we upgraded to lights and sirens and we made our way over to the scene. Um and when we when we got to the scene there was multiple multiple fire units uh in in different locations around uh the Cielo Vista Walmart uh complex there as well as uh multiple law enforcement agencies and different vehicles um and it was at first it was pretty chaotic um for everybody trying to figure out the best place to gain access to the scene uh the best place for us to position our apparatus um for you know to be able to expedite uh transport in the best way and so um a triage officer had established himself on the scene and uh basically what the triage officer does is um try to get uh, uh an idea of the big picture and uh decide which patients are going to be transported out first and which ones will be uh postponed a little bit due to the the seriousness of their injuries um when when my unit arrived on scene on on uh, rescue 1 was the ambulance that I was on that day uh me and the on the lieutenant position the apparatus um in a in a a a way that we had a a, a good means of egress so that we could uh we could load up a patient and, and leave we were immediately told to to go ahead and take our gurney down the hill um where what they had a, a supposedly a patient waiting for us so we made our way down there um that was when that was when you started seeing uh the real the real gravity of what was going on there was uh a lot of people screaming and crying there was uh people bleeding um there was blood on the floor um and there was just quite a bit of chaos going on so uh, we had to uh we had to try to do our best to you know um get as many people out as fast as we could in that situation so um everybody was trying to work together a lot of the citizens that were that were there that were not injured um pretty much jumped into a uh, rescue role um it seemed like automatically um there was so many people that were um shouting out different orders and asking for help in different locations and um but it 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 was really notable how many uh of just regular citizens community members jumped into action that day um i don't think the the success of our mission would have been accomplished um as well as it was if it wasn't for the 
those good Samaritans on the scene that really helped us out. Um, as far as bringing patients out of the Walmart uh, on flatbed um, carts and in shopping carts. Um, so initially the, uh, the patient that I was uh, gonna be charged with transporting was, uh, he had a gunshot wound to the, the right calf and uh, he was on a flatbed cart and I, uh, we started putting him onto my gurney and uh, initiating transport for him. And that's when we were, that's when the confusion sort of started uh, to get a little worse. They told us, you know what, we need rescue one to report to their ambulance. You already have a patient in there waiting for you. So we went ahead and left our gurney there and we made our way back up the hill to where we, we, uh, we found our ambulance was already loaded up with, um, with our patient, which was an elderly male who had an entrance, uh, a gunshot wound entrance uh, to the upper right chest and an exit wound out the, the lower left abdomen. Um, and he were, yes. let, me, let me stop you there because I may ask you to come to go back to you to do some more description of what you found that sure. day. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to thank you for uh, talking about the Good Samaritans who helped and I want to thank you for being a first responder like that. I can only yes, imagine how difficult it is to do something like that when you put your, your own life in danger to save other lives. So thank you for doing what you did. And we'll talk more sure. about what you saw and how it affected you in a, in a moment. I sure. want to move on to Mr. Acuna, um, who was uh, told me before that you were going to have a celebration on that day and everything changed, correct? Um, yes. Dina, that's that's correct. Um, what what happened was uh, I remember uh, remember very vividly. I was actually getting ready to put the finishing touches on everything. It was uh, my birthday the next day, and um, I had to get together with with some friends, some close friends. We were just going to hang out by the pool, um, barbecue, and and what have you. And I was um, going out there to the to the area with all the final stuff in my hands and uh, checking updates on text. Uh, messages to see who, you know, who was on their way or what have you. And uh, that's when the messages started coming in or the Facebook posts, um, Twitter, everything that, that, that we saw in the feeds. And um, that just intensified at first, it, you know, I thought, oh, okay, well, it's, you know, some kind of confusion. Maybe somebody had a gun and, and it got blown out of proportion. And after a while you saw, no, that's not the case. You actually, we actually have an incident here. And, um, and it was pretty intense. So I think it was it was a good maybe half hour or an hour, um, just kind of assessing what was happening and, and taking it all in. And um, and of course, you know that's that's a type of who wants to celebrate anything at that at that point, you know. And so I mean, I, I messaged my friends and I told them, um, you know, I understand. You know, it's it's you know this this is a very you know horrible situation. So. Um, definitely, you know, stay home with your families, everything, you know, what, what you need to do. And, and a lot of them, you know, either, you know, lived alone, they, they had already made those plans and, and they said, no, well, we're going to go one by one. And, and um, so what ended up having, happening, it, it turned into more of a kind of like supportive type of uh, um, situation where everybody kind of came together. We absorbed the news as it came in throughout the entire day, throughout the night. Um, Everybody obviously at some point, you know, had their kind of emotional reaction to what was going on. It either caught up to you later or um, it, it, it kind of, you know, built up based on everything that was happening and we were seeing. And, and so it turned out to be kind of like this, you know, therapeutic session for everybody and being together and being able to be um, with one another. But, um, you know, and, and it was just very interesting that, that you wake up the next morning and you kind of hear this sometimes when, when these types of things happen. And um, you wake up the next morning, just you have this kind of like emotional hangover, right? In terms of what was what happened the day before, and, and this kind of like sudden realization that 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 happened, that wasn't some kind of dream or nightmare. You know, this this really occurred, and and kind of dealing it or trying to deal with it um, in in the days that that followed after the incident. When you found out that the shooter targeted the Latinx community. What were your thoughts? I, I think of anything, it, it was just, you know, initially it, it was a, a flood of anger because you knew that kind of um, 
anti-Hispanic, anti-Latinx, and anti-Latino rhetoric had been out in, in the environment for so long, right? And um, you saw it in the supposed manifest that he had put together, manifesto, excuse me, um, where, where, where he did that and where, where he had to kind of come hundreds of miles and all these hours that he had all this time to kind of think about it and maybe turn around and, and not do it, that, that that hatred fueled him, right, to come out here and do that. And so, you know, putting all that information together, it was, it was more, than, more than anything, it, it was kind of anger at, at how, you know, how, how that kind of evolved and got there based on, you know, what he, he mentioned in, in, in his uh, details of, of what, he, what he, he was going to do. And then, um, and also, I mean, some, some kind of, you know, you know, sadness and hurt as well to think, you know, not knowing any of these people, this individual came out and, and just wanted to kill them because of who they are, because of the color of their skin. And how, how could somebody do that? And then that coming so close to home. I mean, we've seen it, right? Over, over the past four years or, or so have you. And um, it, it's, it's gone on. And, but to have it happen in, at our doorstep was an entirely different kind of feeling. And so uh, definitely a, a mixed bag of emotions. That leads me to you, Al Maldonado, with LULAC. Uh, didn't happen at your doorstep exactly, but LULAC jumped into action um, immediately after it happened. Why don't you describe um, briefly what happened to you that morning? Yes, well, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm here in Houston, Texas. We're about almost 800 miles away, but it didn't mean that it did not affect us. Absolutely, it did. We have a population of well over a million Hispanics here in the Houston Harris County area. And we've also had lots of uh, friends and relatives out there that we were aware of. So um, it felt like we, did, we were connected to El Paso. Um, I was at my home when it did occur. Uh, my wife just happened to be flipping the channels and then called me to tell me that something was going on over there in El Paso. And then I realized that it was a, a mass shooting and, um, and that it was occurring over there, basically affecting the national mass shooting of Hispanics. And I said, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. It felt so surreal. But uh, we've, we've had incidents here locally, but there are very few uh, just uh, you know, incidents here where we had people that were just, we had calls coming in to our office about uh, people being discriminated based because they're only speaking Spanish, nothing to the severity that's going on in El Paso. But as soon as that occurred, uh, I started getting phone calls from the membership letting me know if I was watching, watching what was going on. And uh, we got in contact with our state and national offices as well. And they were, of course, they were aware of it as to what was going on, keeping an eye on it. So we immediately uh, went out and put the word out that we were here to support them. And we offer our services and we talked to the local authorities, our sheriff, police department, our mayor. Uh, and then later on, got in contact with the um, the leadership, local leadership here at Walmart, just to make sure that we they were there to support them any way we can and offer any type of assistance. Uh, since then, uh, LULAC as a national organization has gone into action proposing to uh, fight against, uh, I mean, to uh, fight for a ban on assault weapons. And we're still moving on, on that agenda as well. But uh, we have a very large um, chapter out in the we have our Black brothers and sisters out there. We got we immediately got in contact with them, and uh, fortunately, that uh, the ones that we were in contact with were safe. But they were also they, they had a few people that they were they knew very well, who were harmed and injured. So uh, we maintained a vi vigilance here locally just to make sure that uh, this was an isolated incident, that it was a lone wolf. Uh, we had our radar on just to make sure that everything was going to be safe and well over here in Houston and East Texas. But, uh, you know, I, I too felt the anger. Uh, one of the first images that I had, and I'm not a history major, but I love history, was an incident that occurred 100 year, 102 years earlier in Fort Vinny, Texas, which is just outside of El Paso, probably about an hour or two drive along the Rio Grande. That happened in January 1918 where uh, a group of Texas Rangers and uh, U.S. Cavalry came over to this small village to round up 15 men and boys, accused them of theft and uh, killing the local ranchers. They rounded them up from the village, took them to a nearby hill and just shot them to death execution style. And I got, oh my God, it's 1918 all over again. 
And uh, so we really have to be on our, on uh, put our radars on to make sure that something like this never ever occurs again. But uh, terrible tragedy and um, it's one we're not going to uh, forget. Yeah, hate tends to happen over and over again if we don't continuously battle it back. And what I'm hearing from you and from Mr. Acuna and from the people in El Paso is that the people did bond together and band together to respond, but also that you go through a bunch of emotional stages and uh, feelings as you process what's going on. Let me uh, turn to my colleague, Oren Siegel, who was very, very busy on that morning um, to have him explain what happened with him and what he did as a result of what he heard and found out. Yeah, thank you, Dina. And uh, I appreciate hearing uh, the stories uh, and where, where the folks were before. Um, you know, it's, it's different for me. Uh, first of all, I'm in New York City, so sort of far away uh, from, from where uh, this incident happened. And, you know, in a, in a country in which mass shootings occur with uh, regular frequency, um, you know, frankly, I remember it was a little more like the afternoon, early afternoon here in New York uh, on a Saturday. I remember my first uh, thought because I, I spent half my life, frankly, online on Twitter, et cetera. It's just, uh, you know, I constantly have like an IV of news. Um, my first, my first thought was, okay, here we go again. And, and not, not just in mass shooting, but in extremist and hate motivated mass shooting. There's just something about it. Maybe it was the location. Uh, but really it was the fact that we, as a, as a country, um, and, and my team in the center on extremism, uh, had literally just been through this, um, in Poway, California, when a gunman attacked Jews, uh, at a temple there, uh, in Christ Church in New Zealand, you know, halfway around the world, when a gunman uh, attacked and killed 51 Muslims uh, in two mosques there. Um, you know, these were um, three different targets, Muslims, Jews, uh, what eventually was, was clearly the Latinx community, um, but the same ideology motivated those attacks. Um, and they actually had something in common. Um, you know, previously, I, I think uh, Mr. Kunis mentioned uh, the, the manifestos um, that were online. And, um, you know, each one of those attacks that I mentioned, there was a manifesto posted on a platform called HN, expressing why they carried out this attack. And in fact, not just saying why, so that people understood why they were targeting this minority community. And, you know, the shooter in Texas did the same. But it's actually more than that. Um, the El Paso shooter, and I try not to use the names of these shooters as much as possible. I understand when people do so. It's just my preference not to uh, do that. But the shooter um, signaled back to a community of extremists that he knew would not only appreciate the attack that he carried out, um, but in some way, may serve to try to em like hope that they would emulate it, right? So I may be jumping ahead here. My first reaction was, here we go again. I contacted uh, the leadership of ADL saying, just so you know, Center on Extremism, we are tracking this. My team, by the way, investigators and analysts spend too much of their time in these spaces online tracking extremist activities, uh, you know, their language, their campaigns. Um, our goal is to identify extremists, work with law enforcement to try to get them arrested, and try to find other ways to mitigate those threats. So, you know, when there's a mass shooting, in addition to communicating with my leadership, I sort of talk to my team who's ready to go in terms of, all right, what are our first responsibilities? We're not law enforcement. We're not carrying guns, right? We're not um, first responders. We're not able to necessarily, you know, provide medical help. In fact, we're not even in El Paso, um, although one of my colleagues, his family is from El Paso. And so the first thing that we do is how can we help is try to identify, all right, who did this, right? What do we know? How can we perhaps assist? So I also call Dina in our office in Houston, say we're on this. As soon as we find out any information, chatter, extremist chatter, we'll, we'll let you know. 
And it actually did not take very long for us to um, find what appeared to be a manifesto um, that talked about, um, you know, wanting to specifically kill, you know, as many Mexicans as possible, um, you know, used language that we have seen other extremists use. So the concept of the great replacement, I don't need to get into all the details, but to say, you know, there is a foundational white supremacist narrative that is about securing, you know, the white race and demographic changes. The browning of America as they see it is sort of viewed as the primary um, threat to the white race. And that's why there's so much um, hatred, um, fear um, in white supremacist circles toward the um, Latinx community. And by the way, finding that narrative uh, was something that we had recently sort of experienced as a Jewish community. Um, I mean, the thing that came to mind early that morning, even knowing that the victims here, it seemed were clearly targeted because of the color of their skin, right? Because of their perceived nationality, um, because they were brown and different. Let's just call it what it is. You know, we had seen how that had played out within the Jewish community in Pittsburgh. And what I mean by that is 11 Jewish people were killed in that community because of the same white supremacist fears of the browning of this country, of immigrants, of uh, you know, coming in, because they view Jews as controlling the demographic changes in this country. So you know, this is why I always go back to sort of the mission of ADL. You know, we fight anti-Hispanic, anti-Latinx bigotry because we know fighting that enables us to support the Jewish community. And we fight anti-Semitism against the Jewish community because we know it protects all communities. So I mention this because I'm gonna be honest with you, this was going through my mind in the hours after we had found out the shooting because we're finding a manifesto that was unremarkable. I hate to say this, we had seen it so many times before. Online, in the spaces in which white supremacists communicate, and try to egg each other on. In the words that were left behind by shooters in Poway and El Paso and Pittsburgh, and frankly, it can go on and on and on. So El Paso, I would say, right, the worst, deadliest, however you wanna categorize it, attack against a specific community, Latinx community in this country in at least 50 years. Um, but part of a series of attacks that we had seen, the narrative arc of hatred and its deadly consequences did not start in El Paso, um, but it impacted El Paso. So we share uh, our manifesto. We quickly did an analysis of why we believe this person to be um, sympathetic to white supremacist beliefs, shared that with our law enforcement contacts. We shared it with our office who was, um, um, uh, liaising with law enforcement, um, you know, within Texas, um, and then, you know, got, uh, got going for several days, 24 hours a day, looking to see what are other extremists talking about? Are they going to try to copycat, right? Are they going to try to use this moment? Because one of the elements that El Paso speaks to is a broader concept um, that some white supremacists call accelerationism, we've seen this play out, is that they believe the time for race war is now. That, you know, the only way to start that is to create chaos. And frankly, I mean, we're talking about something that happened a year ago. This was before a pandemic. Um, you know, somebody said 1918, the tragedy that occurred there. And then I think Dina said time sends to sort of, the hate keeps coming back even 101 years later. Well, here we are, you know, 100 years after another pandemic as well. And um, I would just say that, you know, the hate that we saw uh, that day, the violence, um, is something that we are especially concerned about, not only in the memory of the victims of last year, but because we know that there are going to be people today who are going to try to leverage that same hatred that glorified this shooter um, and will try to, um, you know, make the, certainly the next couple of months, but I'd say even longer, 
um, ripe for these white supremacists. So um, maybe I should stop there, but you know, unfortunately the takeaway is um, that Saturday was similar to many other Saturdays. And I think our task as a community and everybody on this call is to make sure those Saturdays happen less and less often. Thank you, Oren, and thank you for doing what you do because what you described is a very difficult job of finding out and connecting that when hate touches one of us, it touches all of us and it spreads very easily. And there are people who dedicate their lives to spreading hate. So uh, I appreciate the fact that you've dedicated your life to fighting hatred in the way that you do and the Center on Extremism does. I wanna go back to Mr. Lefevre and um, to the point, when hate hits someone else, it affects us. You, uh, I stopped you as you were describing um, kind of a chaotic scene and Oren just mentioned chaos. Um, what was your reaction when you saw that this shooter had targeted a certain segment of the community? And, and how has, have you changed since then? Uh, so personally for me, um, it was a, it was just a, a real feeling of disgust um, in, in, in reading that manifesto um, and finding out that he was definitely not ashamed of the fact that he carried out the, this, this, uh, this shooting in an effort to kill um, Hispanic people. So um, I, I'm born and raised in El Paso. Um, I have friends and family that are all um, uh, Hispanic and, uh, you know, my wife is Hispanic. And so um, for me to read this, you know, it's uh, like I said, it was, it's just a real feeling of disgust for, for such hatred. Um, and El Paso has been known, uh, has been noted as one of the safest uh, communities in the United States for quite some time. Um, a lot of people don't know that, but it's, it's true. And um, the, the community in El Paso is very diverse. And um, for somebody to, to drive across the country to come into our back door and carry out such a hateful act, it, it, uh, yeah, it, it was very upsetting. And you know, it just, it, it changed the whole gravity of, of everything that, that was involved with the situation. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, you know, that being said, the, uh, the feeling now towards, um, towards looking back on it is for me, I, I have people that ask me about the, the call all the time. And, you know, it's, it's a little bit difficult for me to talk about, um, you know, just being a, being a white person and then having that feeling of, uh, you know, maybe people look at me like one of them, you know? Um, so it, unfortunately that's a part of, of what goes on with all of this stuff. And, um, you know, that's, that's sort of been, uh, it's impacted me um, in, in living in El Paso and just, you know, hoping that people understand that not, not all people are, are racist and, you know, so. Well, thank you for your honesty. We really appreciate that. Um, we have a question from one of the participants about um, when in this time of mass shootings, do departments like yours seek to train civilians to do what the civilians did on that day? Um, so yes, there is a, there's an organization um, that's actually a national organization. It's called uh, a CERT. It's the Community Emergency Response Team. Um, and the, they're, uh, it's an organization that uh, it, in a nutshell, what they do is they, they teach um, volunteers from the community about basic disaster response skills. Um, it's sort of just a broad spectrum of, of ways that those people can be able to respond in a disaster, um, whether it be something like this or like a natural disaster. Um, it's an it's a organization of people that uh, are prepared to volunteer their services and, and help out. Um, in this type of a situation, um, uh, in the mass shooting, um, I'm not sure if, the, if that organization played a role. Um, I know for sure they weren't um, on the scene while I was there because I, I'm, I, I would think it would probably take them a little while to mobilize. So um, the, the people that were helping out on the scene were just uh, 
just regular civilians. I mean, there was off-duty nurses I know of that were there. There was off-duty law enforcement I know of that were there, off-duty firemen, and just regular people of the community that everyone just jumped into action to really help out as much as they could. So, but yeah, so in answer to your question, there is that organization called CERT, um, Community Emergency Response Team. Thank you very much. Um, I wanna go back to Oren and Al and the Consul General. Oren, you, you talked a little bit about trends you're seeing as far as white supremacists are concerned. Are you seeing any trends as far as um, hate against the Latinx community? Yeah, um, you know, <clears throat> I mean, first I'll say, you know, extremists um, never sort of miss an opportunity to leverage a public discussion to promote their agenda. And, you know, in the past several years, you know, I mean, issues of, of um, you know, uh, the immigration, for example, have been front and center and have, and have, and have taken a tone um, uh, that has been highly problematic. Right. I mean, the, the, the language uh, that has been used has been intentionally, um, it seems, inflammatory. And, and extremists are going to take their cues from that. They're going to look for openings to try to sort of win hearts and minds. And so, you know, while the good news, I mean, you know, knock on wood to some degree is that the, the type of mass casualty attack by a white supremacist um, that we saw on several occasions last year, including in El Paso, has not happened. Um, it, you know, since um, we still see uh, the community, um, the, the Latinx community, the immigrant community um, being targeted through propaganda and online rhetoric. I mean, so much of what we do to understand their, their ideas, their hatred and where they might act next, right, is to see what is the online discussion, right? I mean, that's, that's where the action is. And so, you know, in the year since the, the attack, We've seen distributions of white supremacist propaganda. Um, you know, uh, in 2020, we've seen over 2,700 uh, incidents of white supremacist propaganda around the country, many of which feature, um, you know, these very sort of explicit anti, um, either immigrant or anti-Hispanic uh, uh, types of narratives. You know, there's a white supremacist group called Patriot Front, which is responsible for many of the flyering around the country. By the way, they are, they are located in Texas. That's where they're based. Um, and many of their uh, uh, flyers say, you know, one nation against invasion with, you know, sort of uh, imagery of people trying to, you know, cross a border, for example. Um, during the pandemic, there's been a lot of uh, effort to talk about, you know, not just that immigrants might come and spread a virus, and that's why you need to sort of close borders, but that diversity itself, diversity is the virus. And so that's some of the language that is used, you know, in that propaganda. And, and again, these are, these are people, you know, that it, it goes beyond sort of an online platform in which people are communicating their hate. I mean, I hate to say this, that's very, very common and very concerning. It's people who are willing to go down to the ground, print out a flyer that they created that says, you know, stop coronavirus, deport all illegal aliens, close the borders, immigration kills, right? These are the narratives that motivated the El Paso shooter. And we're seeing them posted in the public sphere. Many of us are not going out as much, you know? Listen, I'm, I'm socially isolating as much as I can, but there are still people who don't have that option. And they are, you know, facing um, the type of propaganda in their communities that are being posted by haters. And more importantly, access to hate and extremism um, is frankly more easily achievable than in any other time in human history. In fact, the narratives that motivated some of these shooters that we saw, including the El Paso shooter, exist in the same space as legitimate news. And the more that our kids are spending time at home, whether it's, you know, remote learning, et cetera, the more that these narratives can seep in. Many of you might have heard of TikTok. You know, this is a very popular app with, with kids. Um, and, you know, we know that these narratives that I'm talking about are appearing there. I'll make one last comment on this. 
my kids who are young spend time in the online spaces that my investigators spend time looking for extremism and hate. I mean, that's all you need to know about extremism today is that any platform that is available, extremists will try to exploit. And a fundamental narrative, um, especially a fundamental white supremacist narrative, is trying to portray uh, the Hispanic community um, as a threat to the white race. That has not stopped. Um, and that's why it's so important for people to speak out about it consistently and, and clearly. Thank you, Oren. And I want to just point out to everybody that my wonderful colleague Monica has put in the chat um, a link to a report on anti-immigrant extremists. And to your point, Oren, about the different narratives, I just want to say you can trust the ADL narrative. So if you go to ADL.org and read our reports from our Center on Extremism, you're reading something that has good, solid backing to it, thanks to Oren and his, his staff. Let me switch over to Al Maldonado. And Al, what are you seeing as far as trends in um, anti-Latinx hate? Well, we are getting phone calls uh, periodically to our district office in regards to uh, Hispanics being discriminated, whether it be in the workplace or just being out in public for speaking Spanish. Uh, nationally, there has been a couple of incidents that we've been keeping track of. I know one that one in particular that happened last Christmas in Clive, Iowa, I believe, where a 14-year-old Hispanic girl was on her way to a basketball game near her junior high and then got run over by a 43-year-old white woman. And the white woman claimed that she did it on purpose intentionally because she was Hispanic. That made national news. I, I, rem I remember seeing that on cable news networks. And, um, and then... Uh, Earlier that year, uh, there was an incident in Boston, Massachusetts, where a uh, mother and daughter were just out in public speaking Spanish, and uh, two 25-year-old uh, white, white girls came up to them and assaulted them. So uh, that case is currently in, in the courts right now, and uh, there's probably a call hearing coming up next month on that. But these little incidents, isolated as they are, they are occurring. And uh, we, we just have to be more vigilant as a national organization and we are trying to maintain that network as to keeping track of what's going on nationally, statewide as well, of these trends. So uh, I, I think uh, there's going to be more incidents like that. We just have to be out, out on the lookout to uh, be aware of them. We, we, uh, our community is aware that we have a, a website for them to contact, a telephone number for them to contact. And we're in constant uh, communication with our local authorities and our elected officials. So. Um, uh, we have our radar on, radar on, and keep an eye on this. Thanks, Al. Let me turn to uh, Consul General Ibarra. What are you seeing as far as um, the people that are your constituents? What are they reporting to you? Well, actually, I think um, the same. We have we have um, received reports on um, anti-migrant rhetoric, of course. Uh, but also racist rants against um, the Hispanic community because of their color, because as uh, Soren was saying, because they speak Spanish. You know? Actually, uh, just to say that in, in one trip that I had uh, to, to Canada in my previous position, I was in Canada and somebody heard me talking with my colleagues in Spanish and they shout, go back to your country. You know? So we, you can see it all over the place. Uh, is something that is, is uh, happening. Um, and that is why, um, as a result of the 23 persons that died in El Paso on August 3rd, 2019, nine of those uh, Mexicans, um, the Mexican government considered this uh, terrible day uh, the worst strategy uh, the Mexican community has faced in the United States. And because of what Oren was saying, the Mexican government decided to go um, internationally uh, really to condemn this type of action. So first, uh, the Mexican government went to the, to the Organization of American States to promote a, res a resolution condemning the shooting in El Paso, but also uh, to condemn and um, raise awareness on, on hate uh, speech, racism, xenophobia, white supremacism, uh, so that everybody condemned them. So, the Mexican government did, did that uh, in the framework of the OAS, and then it took it to the UN 
also because we are convinced and the Mexican government is convinced that this is something that we really need to address. We need to promote awareness so that people know that uh, what is happening, so that people know that they need to report it so that we can take a specific action. Uh, but, I, but I guess uh, this was, this was uh, very important for us and we will continue fighting this type of, of, of uh, racism and, and xenophobia that we find um, all over the place. And obviously it had a, a terrible shock uh, here in, in, in this binational community, precisely because El Paso is, one, is considered one of the safest cities in, in the United States. And as it was mentioned, having someone come from miles away just to kill people without any reason, uh, obviously it, it had a great shock. And in the case of the Mexican community, learning afterwards that besides what it was mentioned in the manifiesto uh, about uh, the Hispanic community, knowing that he targeted specifically Mexican nationals because of the nationality, that was that was very shocking for us and that that's why we have uh, this commitment in really fighting uh, as hard as we can as we move on all these types of, of, of hate ideas. Speaking of that commitment, um, and we're going to move in, we're getting a lot of questions about reporting incidents and things like that. ADL um, and the Mexican government are working together to try to encourage people to report incidents and crimes, hate incidents and hate crimes when they see them. And so, uh, Consul General, I'd love for you to uh, talk about the memorandum of understanding that um, there's actually two of them. One of at least one of them was, I think both of them were signed before um, what happened in El Paso. Can you talk a little bit about that and what that involves as far as reporting incidents? Sure, of course, actually, um, as I mentioned from the very beginning, we, we value this uh, relationship with ADL. And yes, we have signed two MOUs. The first one was in uh, 2017, and basically it, it aimed to enhance the capacities of the, of the Mexican consulate network. As you know, we have 50 consulates in the US. We are the country with the most consulates in another country. Uh, so to enhance the capabilities of the consulate to identify, report, and document any case of, uh, of discrimination, defamation, intolerance, hate crimes. Um, so the Mexican consulates have received training by, by ADL uh, specifically, specifically in all these areas, so, so we value that. And then, um, actually, on May of last year, we signed another um, MOU specifically uh, related to, to, hate, uh, to hate crimes. Um, and uh, as part of that, we launched a, a, a social media campaign so that people could uh, denounce hate. The campaign is called Denuncia el Odio in Espanol, in Spanish, denounce hate so that our community can feel safe to report any uh, hate incident to the consulate so that we can take the proper the proper action along obviously with law enforcement and and local authorities so we we value that that uh, relationship uh with adl uh very strongly and i see that in the chat uh monica also posted adl's uh website for reporting incidents adl.org slash report incident um i want to give some time for questions from people who have put their questions in the chat. And I want to ask my colleague, Margie, who's been monitoring that to um, ask some of the questions and we'll give, uh, we'll maybe take 10 or 15 minutes to do that. Then I want everybody on the panel to give me a closing thought as to how we go forward fighting this kind of hate. What is, what should we be doing to fight this kind of hate? Margie, can you go ahead and give us some questions? Thanks. Sure, Dina. Thank you so much. One of the questions that we have has to do with how to handle um, after the attack or the trauma of, um, of an incident, how do Latin or Latino or Hispanic community who has faced trauma and who have been through the El Paso incident, 
how do they become stable or conduct their normal life after something like this happens against or towards Mexicans or Latinos? Are there resources available? Um, maybe Al should answer that question first, because I would imagine LULAC, well, probably the Consul General also would have resources for that. Al? Yes, well, well yes, here at LULAC and nationally, you know, we, we uh, we have we have put out some press conferences and some press releases and and uh, offer support to our community as well. We do have some local resources that, that we can refer them to, uh, but uh, we're, we're pretty well known here in, in, in this part of the state. And uh, not only do we get the responses from from Houston Harris County, but from uh, Southeast Texas as well. I mean Beaumont, Lufkin, way up north near Dallas, uh, we, we they come to us and uh, seek our assistance and support. Uh, we've also set up some local chapters up there to go out to a community, spread the word as to uh, how to keep, um, to be aware of, your, of what's going on in your community. Uh, and, if, and if anything does occur, to contact us immediately. We do have a, uh, a phone number where they can contact the website as well. And so that way we can try to keep track of them. But uh, we're, we're pretty active here and uh, the community knows that we are here for them. So. Uh, we're ready to work with our authorities here to make sure and to give them the, the assistance and help that they need. Okay, and in the chat, it's posted that El Paso United Family Resiliency Center offers help to anyone affected directly or indirectly by the August 3rd tragedy, three, free of charge. Um, also, United Way with El Paso Community Center and the Paso del Norte Health Foundation came together to establish a family resiliency center in El Paso, which was just mentioned. Um, Consul General, um, what kinds of services does the consulate offer? I know you talked about people going to the hospital and so on. No, actually we, we offer a very large um, array of options of, uh, of assistance for, for the community. Uh, obviously the 50 consulates in the US offer the, the same type of help. We have in all of, in all of them, we have what we call the, the health window where we provide uh, medical assistance and we uh, send people to low cost clinics, um, et cetera. But, but in terms of what happened here in El Paso from the very beginning, uh, working with allies and partners, we offer different options, both in Ciudad Juarez and in El Paso for emotional support. I think this is one of the, of the most important uh, requests from people after the 3rd of August shooting it was emotional support. So with the help of different allies that you have al already mentioned, we were able uh, to provide those. And obviously in, in some cases, uh, a different type of, uh, of monetary assistance in a specific cases. Uh, obviously, as I mentioned, legal advice, free legal advice on, on different issues. So we have a, a, a big array of, of things that we can support the community with from documents because obviously to in order for them to receive some of these benefits uh, they need to to have an, an identification so we provide these these IDs we talked uh, we help them uh, liaise with uh, with the federal and and state authorities to follow up the cases so there are really a huge array of, of uh, assistance that all the consulates can provide nationwide in the United States. Anybody else have an answer to that question before I ask Margie to ask another one? Okay, Margie. Okay, we have another question about the organization QAnon. Um, are they a hate group and how dangerous are they? And are there other groups like that um, that people should be aware of? That'd be for Oren. <laughs> no, I thought, I thought maybe there'd be one day where I could go without talking about QAnon, but it's impossible. Um, so, I mean, okay, it, it, QAnon is without getting into too much depth, and maybe we can uh, share our uh, backgrounder from our website in the chat so people can explore further if they want. But it's, 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 a, it's a pretty far-reaching conspiracy theory, more than anything else. 
um, and it's very sort of popular amongst those uh, very, very uh, um, public supporters of the current administration. That doesn't mean that current, anybody who loves Trump loves QAnon, far from the truth. Um, however, um, it, it, it essentially believes in a range of conspiracy theories um, that uh, uh, began um, basically online, as many of these sort of complicated conspiracies and, and hate movements begin. It's like a, a network. Essentially, they believe there's somebody who's providing information uh, that is against the so-called deep state, which is trying to sort of control our lives. I can go into details about how celebrities fit into their conspiracies. I don't want to um, make people dumber by listening to me explain their theories. That being said, you can absolutely find all their beliefs there. The bottom line for us, there has been um, incidents of violence associated with QAnon, including murder. Um, so for us, um, as the FBI notes, conspiracy theories um, are, are a category in which they track violent extremists. We believe that conspiracy theories are often the foundation for much of the hate that we see. Um, anybody who's willing to believe in conspiracy theories that are so out there um, doesn't mean they're necessarily going to engage in violence, but there's a subset of those in QAnon that clearly go beyond sort of fantasies and, and frankly weirdness into hate-based conspiracy theories that can have impact on communities. So bottom line is, from our side in terms of tracking um, extremists, um, and hatred and violent extremism, QAnon is part of our menu of movements to monitor. Thank you, Oren. Margie? Okay, so we have another question related to mass shootings, the increase in um, white supremacist related activities um, that was mentioned, and reporting. So how does uh, reporting these things that we see online impact um, and impact the work that ADL does as well as um, our, our other organizations on the panel? And what do you do with that information? Orrin, why don't you go? I guess sorry. So if, if I understood the, the question correctly, it's, uh, you know, people are coming across um, issues online, hate, extremism, and, and reporting. Um, and then what do we what do we do with it? And, and how does it inform our work? Did I get that right? Correct. Okay. So um, first I would say if, if somebody is seeing, um, you know, real threats to violence on online spaces, um, definitely you need to let law enforcement know, right? Uh, reporting to ADL is not a replacement for law enforcement. Um, so that's sort of critical. Um, we do... Uh, both uh, track incidents of, of hatred and bigotry, um, in part because, you know, it's that collection that enables you to resource to the threat. Um, you know, for example, we have a heat map um, on our website, which has uh, various different data sets. I mentioned white supremacist propaganda, terrorist plots, attacks, etc. And, you know, they're searchable by zip code, by state. We believe that a way to assure that elected officials and others take the threat of hate and violence seriously is to present them with the facts on the ground. So reporting to us sometimes lets us know about something that we may have not seen. You know, there are billions and billions of hours of videos and posts every single day. As great as I believe my team is, we can't be in all spots at every time. And then last point in terms of reporting, um, this is when it comes to hate incidents. Um, you know, again, it, it's about um, raising public awareness. It's about providing clues to investigators like in the Center on Extremism of where they have to look at. But I will say it also enables people to engage in the fight against hate and extremism. Not everyone's gonna feel comfortable standing up in front of a, a crowd and saying, you know, uh, putting themselves out there. Not everybody has that opportunity. Anybody can report an incident when they see it. In fact, sometimes that's a way to make sure that your everyday average person feels like they are part of the fight against hate by reporting an incident of hate. It sounds small, but it makes a big difference. Thanks, Oren. I want to point out too that another thing that Monica put in the chat 
is a link to ADL's heat map, which Orrin just spoke about. And um, we had a question about how do, how many white supremacists are there in Texas? How, how does Texas rank in the country as far as white supremacists are concerned? Normally I'd ask Orrin to answer that, but you can go to the heat map and get a good comparison. So I invite you to go there because I just want to get to, to another question from Margie and then let everybody kind of give me their closing thoughts on where, how do we move forward from this and how do we fight hate together? So Margie, you had one other point? I had one other question and that's um, directed towards Josh and Gabe. How have your activities changed as a result of this incident? How has it impacted you and have you changed your activities and how you relate in the world? Josh, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, so obviously it's, uh, it's, it's hard to ignore um, the feelings that, that go on in your mind after um, seeing something like that incident. Um, so for me personally, um, you know, when I, when I have my kids with me and I go, let's say for example, to Walmart to go shopping, um, obviously you're, you're just, it's in the back of your mind that something like that is, is possible. And you just kind of, um, you're a little bit more alert, um, after having gone through something like that. Um, whenever I go eat at a restaurant, I always make sure that I'm facing the door. I always make sure that I, I note where my exits are at and you, you just, you, you keep an eye on people a little bit more than normal. Um, and just maybe, you know, take note of somebody that might be ask, uh, acting strange or um, out of the ordinary. Um, it, it just, it just all, um, it's just all of basically, you're a little bit more on alert now um, after, after having gone through something like that. Um, let's go to Gabe. What, what have you changed? Um, thanks, Dina. So, so a lot of what uh, Josh mentioned, I mean, it's, it's, it's very much true on, on my end in terms of, you know, um, being cautious and, and kind of alert of your surroundings, right? And, but, but I think a, a big part of it is that when, when something like this happened, I mean, the, the anger, a big part of the anger when, when this happened was that there was this feeling of kind of helplessness, you know, and that, you know, what do you do about it? And one of the things that, that I found personally is, um, getting involved in some way and, and supporting different groups, you know? So for me, you know, supporting groups like ADL, supporting groups like LULAC, um, things along those lines where, where you know if, if, whether you're, you're supporting them financially, whether you're helping spread the word on social media about their efforts, things along those lines that are, are going to help because these organizations dedicate themselves to fighting hate on this, on this grand scale, right? And so, so while you can do things individually within your community, also helping these organizations with their efforts uh, across the nation, sometimes globally, um, helps as well. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's one of the biggest things in terms of, of how, how you kind of deal with it and to have some kind of sense of um, accomplishment, right? And instead of just having these pent up emotions about the situation and, and not really being able to do anything. Thank you so much. And um, to uh, that point and to Oren's point about reporting, I just wanna uh, turn everyone to the chat too for a second because my friend Christina Garza from the FBI posted another place you can report. So there are all sorts of places where you can report. Um, you can report to law enforcement. So that would include the FBI. You can report to ADL. You can report to the consulates. Consul General, um, what kinds of things have you changed? Well, I think uh, the you know uh, the the importance of uh, of really raising uh, awareness on on this issue. I think that that's key. That's why I we value this type of when of webinar because we need to to pass around the world that uh, that this is happening. This is not something that that you read and that's it. This is happening. Uh, hate speech is going around, and we need it, we need to address it. Uh, so that's why we we tell the community report any type of incident. Uh, 
uh, many people don't feel comfortable uh, reporting it to law enforcement, so that's why they can come to the consulate and we'll be sure to report it to law enforcement, federal, state, local authorities so that we can really take action. Uh, but something that I wanted to, to mention um, to finish is uh, I think we cannot highlight enough the solidarity and unity of this community in El Paso uh, and Ciudad Juarez. Um, I think everybody mentioned the, the Good Samaritans, but it was everybody. Everybody pulled together to help uh, the victims uh, in many ways. So something that really uh, that I kept myself is 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 how unified is this is this community? How strong is El Paso uh, and and Ciudad Juarez? So. Uh, Thank you, thank you for, for the opportunity to share uh, some of the thoughts uh, that we have and, and be sure that uh, we are convinced that we need to, to keep fighting uh, hate speech, racism, xenophobia, white supremacism, and the Mexican government will do uh, whatever it needs to do to promote international action against this type of, uh, of movements. Thank you, Consul General. Al? Yes, and thank you again for, for having me on here. You know, the trend that we're seeing here, what, what we're trying to do at LULAC is that, uh, you know, of course, we foresee these smaller incidents happening again. Uh, but Hispanics are not only concentrated in the American Southwest, in Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, and California. There's a growing trend to go outside these, these regions. There's a large Hispanic population in Iowa that, where I mentioned those, where an incident occurred. We're in, we're in Georgia, the Carolinas, and Tennessee. So we're trying to organize our, our presence over there so that way they can have the support that they need uh, should, such, should such incidents occur. But um, we're growing and the Hispanic community is growing into, into these areas. We wanna be there to, to offer that support because we anticipate that another Iowa incident can happen again or something much worse, which we cannot afford. So um, here in Houston, we're, we're, we're pretty much well organized. Uh, we're out there in East Texas as well, where there used to be a, uh, a large presence of a KKK uh, out there. And um, so we are trying to establish our, our presence out there in these small states, in these small rural areas where there's a growing population of Hispanics in there. So um, thank you again for having us. We appreciate it, and we're here to offer any kind of support you might need. Thank you. All right, I'm going to ask everyone for final thoughts, um, and let Orin didn't get a chance to see to say if he changed anything. Had have you changed anything as a result of what happened in El Paso a year ago? Um, I'm hiring new more staff in order to <laughs> keep up, but does that count? Yes. That's that's a that's a frightening change. Uh, so, so so what are your final thoughts, Oren? What do you what do you think people need to do going forward? Yeah, so I, I appreciate this question, and I'm gonna be I'm gonna be short. I think uh, you know the last couple of weeks there have been a lot of anniversaries of, of bad things that have occurred, um, and El Paso being one, and, and and others. And it seems like every year there's more and more of these terrible anniversaries of terrible mass shootings and violence that occur. What we can't sort of uh, neglect is, you know, the heat map was just shared with everybody. We have over, I think, 15,000 data points of hate and extremism. That every one of those points on a map in this country of hate and violence is not just a story of bad, but of communities like the folks that you have I've heard from today coming together and pushing back against that hate, helping people, being allies, supporting each other. Like those are the stories, frankly, that are not told enough. And so my sort of last word would be, you know, as much as I have to pay attention to the violence and the haters and the people who are doing bad things, I promise you uh, as an agency, ADL is paying attention to our partner organizations, to other leaders who are using those moments to try to remind people why we have to be better toward one another. And so to me, that's my last thought, the hope in the face of the violence that we see. That's what motivates me every single day. So I appreciate being uh, part of this conversation. Thank you. 
Mr. Acuna, Gabriel Acuna, what, what are your thoughts, closing thoughts? Uh, closing thoughts, I, I kind of want to piggyback because that, that's one of the thought, thoughts I wanted to mention in terms of uh, what Mr. Lefebvre, what Mr. Uh, Siegel, and even um, uh, the Consulate General mentioned in terms of El Paso is that, okay, yeah, there, there was definitely a lot of anger, right? There's a lot of, you know, sadness, but there, there was also pride in, in the days and weeks that followed where you saw so much support come from the community. As Mr. Lefebvre mentioned, uh, in terms of people helping, that, that's who El Paso is. You know, people, instead of running off, were, were grabbing carts and, and helping carry people out. You saw so many fundraisers from local small businesses, from organizations, raising money, you know, selling items where they donated uh, the, the proceeds. So, so I think that's one of the things to kind of, it's important to highlight that. And, um, and uh, uh, again, as part of closing thoughts, you know, the hate very definitely, you know, definitely affected victims, but it affected the community as well. And one of the things uh, about hate is, is what is it based off of ignorance, right? Um, so a big part, I think, is in terms of education. And it begins at home, right? It begins at home, whether you're, you're teaching your children or whether children are teaching their parents or their elders. Um, it, it begins with, uh, you know, support of organizations such as the ADL, LULAC, who are out there fighting hate again. And whether it's, you know, a financial support or um, education awareness and sharing things on social media um, with others. Um, to help kind of build that, that build that work, network and knowledge. Um, our educational system, you know, wh where is it there in terms of teaching our children, you know, not to hate and and, and um, the effects of it. And then, of course, our elected officials. I think that was mentioned once before. You know, what are they doing to make sure that's that's fought? And you know, and can they do more? And, and what laws are being passed? So, in terms of uh, proceeding, I mean, I think that those are kind of not that they're next steps. Hopefully, they're they're already there's already some traction starting with that but that it's, it's moving forward and it continues and only builds from there. Yeah, it needs to be continuous work exactly. in that regard. Um, Al Maldonado, what are your last thoughts? Yeah, uh, well, definitely we need to um, you know, educate our community. Uh, we, work, we work closely with them. And just, just to show that we support one another, uh, teach our children, you know, what, what it is to do good and to be good and to uh, offer our community or any support. Um, I know that when I go out in public now that, yeah, my, my antennas are on, uh, I try to be aware of my surroundings and we, and we try to tell our community that that as well. Uh, just be on the lookout. If you see something, say something, you know, that, that, that phrase that's been going around uh, the country. So, um, you know, we, we've, we've come close together here in Houston as well and support our, our brothers there in El Paso. And um, we just need to continue the trend that, that we are going to be here for them, that we're not going to stop, you know, fighting, fighting hate. We're going to continue to, to meet it head on and to uh, hopefully work with other communities to, to, to let them show that, that we can work together. And hopefully we'll get that message out and start send a good example to the next generation. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Al. Uh, Mr. Lefevre. Hi, so I, I, think it's, um, I think it's worth mentioning um, in this conversation, uh, the fact that uh, we, we, still haven't, we still haven't had the trial uh, for, for uh, this uh, shooter's actions. Um, so I think it's, uh, there's going to be a, a lot of ripple effect in the community um, during that trial and, and following the trial, depending on uh, what comes of it. I know uh, uh, that the shooter has pled um, insanity or temporary insanity um, as his plea for, for the case. So um, I think there's going to be um, an uprising from the community regarding that, um, especially depending on what the outcome of the whole thing is. Um, so it's, uh, I think it's good for us to just, you know, keep an eye on each other and, um, you know, just kind of be aware of the fact that, uh, that, that trial is probably going to bring up some, some, uh, you know, bad taste in people's mouths from that, that have family members that did pass away that day and, um, other people that were adversely affected from the incident itself. So, um, that, that's something that needs to be noted as well as, um, I think Oren had mentioned earlier, um, that he doesn't like to use uh, the shooter's names, um, which I completely uh, agree with. I think 
celebritizing these shooters is the worst thing that the media can do in these situations. Um, I think if we can keep their face off of the news and keep their their name out of the papers, um, it's gonna it's gonna help sort of you know take away the motivation from some of these people that just want some fame. Um, it, it'll it'll deter them from wanting to carry out these actions if if they see that you know even if you do something so terrible you're not going to get the sort of um celebritization recognition that you're after um I, I think we do need to to make sure that we keep their names out of our mouths when we talk about them just speak of them as the shooter and uh try to see if i mean getting them off the news is is as much as possible is uh is, is a good thing for us Point well taken, thank you very much. And I'm gonna end where we began with the Consul General. Any final thoughts just briefly? We're almost out of time. Thank you, just my, my final thoughts is that, uh, you know, now that it's a uh, first anniversary of, uh, of this terrible shooting, uh, there were uh, many memorials and ceremonies this past uh, 3rd of August. In our case, we unveiled a plaque with the names of the 23 people that die, that died. And why? Because of two reasons. One, we don't want the victims to be forgotten. No, we want them to be remembered that these are people who really passed away in terrible conditions, but also to raise awareness that something like this should never happen again in a community like this. So that's something that, that we want to, to keep reminding people and that's why we uh, unveil this plaque just outside the consulate. This could never happen again, and we cannot forget the victims of this hideous crime. Thank you. Consul General, I think that's a perfect way to end because I think the best way to honor the memory of the victims of this horrific shooting and hate crime is to fight hate every single day so that something like this doesn't happen again. So. I thank everybody on the panel for being with us. I thank everybody for their dedication to this. One of the things I heard in your final comments was um, it's up to us as individuals to fight hate every day, but it's also up to us to work together to fight hate every day. So I think that's something that's very important to remember. I wanna thank our partners in this. Our, they were very, very helpful to us and um, I, am told that we're gonna to try to send out some of those links and information to all of you um, as to how to report the heat map, other points that were made um, after this webinar. So thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you to our fabulous panel of participants. Um, have a good afternoon and keep moving forward fighting hate. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye.